Okay, let's get started. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Kevin Tian, who's, uh, if you don't know him, he's a new professor in computer science. Um, is this the first uh, sort of seminar you've given uh, since you've been here? Or? Theory seminar. Th theory seminar? Okay, great. So uh, Kevin got his PhD from Stanford. Uh, Aaron Sitford was his advisor, and he works on, he's very interested in fast algorithms, um, has a lot of uh, you know linear time algorithms, um, sampling, uh, learning theory, um, and convex optimization. Uh, so we can do it all. And today he'll be talking about convex optimization. He's actually from Texas, so um, you know, welcome back and uh, happy to have you here. Great, yeah. Thanks for the kind introduction, Adam. Um, yeah. So this is uh, going to be about a couple of recent results we had focusing on the topic of parallel stochastic convex optimization. I'll explain what that means shortly. And this is based on um, a number of joint works with a wonderful group of co-authors. So most of us were at Stanford when this uh, line of work first began. So I'll sort of take you through um, the history of some, some of the stuff we'll talk about today. OK, so to start with, let me maybe say something about the problem we're studying and motivate it. Um, this talk is going to be focused on a abstraction uh, of stochastic convex optimization. So let me begin with the most simple case of uh, Lipschitz convex optimization. So here, the goal is to minimize uh, a, a convex function over um, d dimensions to suboptimality error epsilon. And our goal is to compete with um, the best point in some set. So for the purposes of this talk, I'll primarily focus on the case where um, f is 1 Lipschitz, and the set x has bounded domain in the Euclidean norm by 1. Um, if you want to think about more general functions, you can think of this scale invariant notion of relative optimality, where if your function is actually L Lipschitz and defined, you want to compete over a ball of radius capital R, then everywhere I write 1 over epsilon, you should just write down LR over epsilon. And you can think of this LR over epsilon parameter as a relative improvement parameter, right? It's saying like LR is the worst possible suboptimality in the world over this ball. Um, this is how much I want to improve upon that naive estimate. So think of one over epsilon as sort of like a relative improvement uh, parameter for this talk. OK, so what do we know about um, the complexity of solving this problem? So the gold standard agreed upon by the optimization theory community is to bound the number of subgradient evaluations to f. Um, this is a useful primitive in practice because this is often how we actually uh, access uh, the function. Uh, it sort of decouples the nature of uh, accessing the function, computing the gradient quickly, which you can ha have specialized hardware for and the algorithm design itself, right? And actually, the complexity story in this particular case is like very clean. Um, essentially, what it says is that if your goal is to solve Lipschitz convex optimization, uh, and you want to query the subgradient oracle less than d times, you should run subgradient descent. And if you want to query it more than d times, you might as well run a cutting plane method, which is essentially a high dimensional variant of binary search. Um, and this is. Good, because this is actually what we do in practice, right? Like uh, if D is very, I mean, perhaps on potentially non-convex problems, but it establishes a theoretical foundation for why we do this. Um, if D is very large, uh, what do we do in practice? We just run subgradient descent, and this is provably optimal in the, uh, for convex Lipschitz functions. OK, so it seems like a very simple story. Um, let me add one twist to the story, which is we're going to focus on a stochastic model of access to the function f we care about in question. So here, the goal is to compu uh, compute a expected minimizer, so namely a point x, such that in expectation over the randomness of the algorithm, um, x achieves suboptimality gap epsilon. And here, the axis assumption on f that I'm going to make is that we can't query it directly or query its subgradients. What we can do is we can query this uh, sub subgradient estimator g, which is unbiased for a subgradient and has bounded variance, bounded second moment. OK. So let me give you a few examples where uh, this primitive is a useful model for the function we care about in practice. So one basic example is population risk minimization. So here I imagine I'm able to sa query samples from some uh, population distribution. And my goal is to compete with um, the minimizer of the population loss. In other words, I want to minimize the ex expectation over the sampling process of the sample loss. Right. In this case, I can simply design the following stochastic estimator. I query a sample from the distribution and I query the subgradient at that point, right? So here, the question of oracle complexity is really about sample complexity. And the upshot is that uh, by minimizing uh, the, the population loss with these subgradient oracle queries, um, I automatically achieve generalization error, right? I, I'm really targeting the population loss here. OK, um, an alternative viewpoint is 
oftentimes in practice, we really care about minimizing the empirical loss. There's a lot of results that say something like you'd really like to perhaps overfit to your parameters in some way. Um, and in, in this setting, uh, we can think of the function we care about f as simply the empirical risk. And here the savings is more computational rather than statistical. So the point is, if I want to query a subgradient of the overall empirical risk, I would need to query the subgradient of each of my individual functions, right? But instead, I can create a simple unbiased estimator for this empirical risk by sampling a random sample loss and querying that subgradient instead, right? So uh, the stochastic convex optimization problem is sort of like a joint cap, uh, uh, generalization of both of these settings. Okay. And uh, why should you care about stochastic convex optimization? This is arguably one of the most fundamental problems in statistical learning. Um, it captures a lot of uh, uh, common esti uh, estimation problems that uh, folks in statistics have been studying for uh, for decades, including variants of learning generalized linear models and computing M estimators. So this includes a variety of popular loss objectives, such as linear regression, logistic regression, support vector machines, and so on, um, as well as computing maximum likelihood log concave estimators. OK. Cool. So that's SEO in a nutshell. And here the story is like even simpler, right? Actually, we have information theoretic uh, guarantees saying that even in one dimension, uh, the optimal thing to do is stochastic subgradient descent. So the idea is you can just query these, uh, your unbiased estimator, one over epsilon squared times, achieve epsilon expected error. And this is the best thing you can hope for in any dimension. OK. So it sounds like we have a pretty good understanding of the stochastic convex optimization problem. So why am I here giving this talk? We can all just go home, right? Um, it turns out it's the year 2024, right? And we should not be settling for these like silly algorithms that just query the you know the gradient a single time. And we can we can use the fact that we have these uh, these new models of computation, including parallel computation, um, including here at UT, where we can uh, we can query the uh, the oracle multiple times in parallel and try to use this to our advantage, right? So this is the, the problem of highly parallel optimization. OK. Um, so let me let me define this problem a little bit more formally. So here's here's the, the Oracle model we're working in. So we have our side computation, and we have this Oracle we can query for subgradients. right? And uh, this, this problem definition was introduced by Nemirovsky in the, in the 90s. And in a single round of computation, what are we allowed to do? We're allowed to, independently of the Oracle, come up with a sequence of uh, a, a set of n, say, n1 points that we would like to know the answers for simultaneously in parallel. In one round of interaction, we submit a batch of these points um, where let's say n1 is uh, restricted to be a polynomial in d and the accuracy parameter. Right? And the oracle simultaneously gives us back all the answers to all of these points in parallel. right? And then on the side, maybe we run some optimization algorithm to choose the next batch of points to select. And then we just repeat this process you know, for some number of rounds. right? This is the highly parallel uh, model of optimization that Nemirovsky introduced. OK. So I like I like this problem for um, many reasons. But one fundamental reason I like it is it's really talking about the adaptive resilience of convex functions. It's really about a structural effects. How many times do we need to learn something new about the function through this Oracle interaction before we can optimize it? Right. So it's really talking about how many rounds of adaptivity do I need before I can um, minimize loss functions? OK. So. When measuring the complexity of uh, uh, you know, non-parallel uh, algorithms for stochastic co convex optimization, the measure of complexity is very clear. Right? It's how many times did we query the oracle, and how much work did we do on the side. Right? In the parallel setting, I need to introduce this additional depth parameter. So here are the parameters I use to understand the success of parallel algorithms for convex stochastic convex optimization. So um, the first two parameters are about the number of uh, times I query the oracle. So this is both the number of rounds, namely the number of times I have to do this adaptive interaction, as well as the query complexity, right? The total number of queries I ever submit over the course of the algorithm to the oracle, OK? On the other hand, I also care about uh, the computational work I do. So if I have to do a bunch of work on the side in order to figure out what this next batch of points are to select, maybe this is undesirable for other reasons, right? So in particular, I also care about things like the computational depth, the number of rounds of adaptive work I need to do independent of querying this oracle. This is sort of like the classical definition of parallel computing, um, as well as the computational complexity, right? Like the total amount of work used by my algorithm over the course of um, implementing it. OK, so these are the four uh, parameters you should keep in the back of your mind. But basically, it's the same thing as before, but now they both have a depth component as well as a work component. OK. 
Um, let me tell you a little bit about the history of highly parallel optimization. So at baseline, we have these same two uh, you know, algorithms we had from before. At the top, we have stochastic subgradient descent, which requires roughly epsilon minus to the minus two uh, depth, computational depth, and query complexity. And then it needs to do a vector operation in each iteration, right? This is sort of like the baseline. Um, it's not doing any taking any advantage of this parallel model of computation. It's just querying one time, making an update, and iterating over and over again, right? On the other extreme, we have cutting plane methods, which only require d rounds of interaction with the oracle, right? In the stochastic model, you pay some poly epsilon blow up, but roughly speaking, you should think if I want to interact with the model um, at most uh, the, the oracle at most d times, um, I should use subgradient descent, and if it's more than d times, I should use cutting plane methods. Right, so so far I haven't even taken advantage of parallelism at all. Right? So the story gets a little bit more complicated because um, in 2012, uh, Ducci, Bartlett, and Wainwright showed that there is something non-trivial you can do in this parallel model of computation. Um, there's this intermediate regime where epsilon is maybe somewhere between uh, one over d to the one fourth and one over d, where I can do something better. Right, it gets some intermediate trade-off. Don't worry too much about these numbers for now. But the point is, there is something non-trivial you can do. And this really takes advantage of the parallel model of computation. So as you can see, the uh, query complexity is larger than the query depth for some uh, parameters epsilon. OK, so the story got a little bit more clarified by this work uh, of Bubek, uh, Jiang, uh, that should be two Ls rather than two Js, Li, Li, and Sidford, who in 2019 showed the following trade-offs. Um, they said, this regime where the Ducci paper, a Ducci, Bartlett, and Wainwright paper improves upon SGD, this is really a firm trade off. So, below um, roughly root D rounds of interaction with the Oracle, you really should just use SGD. SGD is provably optimal. But if you're going to use more than root D rounds of interaction with the, with the Oracle, you can do something smarter, right? So, this is sort of this intermediate regime. And um, this work uh, in 2019 also conjectured that if you're going to use D rounds of interaction with the Oracle, um, you should use the cutting plane method. So basically, there's this uh, low accuracy regime where SGD is optimal, this conjectured high accuracy regime where cutting plane method is optimal, and then this entire intermediate regime of trade offs where it's not clear what the best thing to do is in terms of taking advantage of this parallel model of computation. Right? Okay, I know there's like a lot of numbers going on here, um, but roughly what you should think is that uh, DBW and BJLS gave competing. Uh, parallel algorithms in this intermediate regime, which don't quite uh, necessarily dominate one another. On the one hand, uh, BJLS uses a improved query depth. So d to the 1 third epsilon to the minus 2 thirds is better than what dbw achieves in this intermediate regime. But on the other hand, they use a lot more queries to do it, right? Like they're, they're querying the, um, the uh, oracle at least d to the 4 thirds time, times, which is actually more than the cutting plane method requires for uh, large values of d. Right? So the story is like starting to make sense, but maybe not completely established yet. So in the first of two works, we basically produced a algorithm which almost achieve, achieves the best of all possible algorithms in this intermediate regime, right? Um, so just to read this line to you, uh, the query depth matches uh, the, pre the prior work by BJLS, and the total query complexity matches the query complexity of SGD. Right, which we know is necessary. So in that sense, Q comp is optimal. C comp, which is the total amount of computational complexity used by, by, by the algorithm, is also optimal. Um, and the query depth is optimal among this intermediate regime for state-of-the-art algorithms. Right. Um, but something funny about this algorithm is it actually uses more computational depth than query depth. So what it needs to do on the side is after querying these, uh, these uh, gradients in parallel, it needs to do some extra work on the side sequentially in order to figure out the next group of points to select. So qualitatively, this is the gap left by the first work uh, that we, we came up with. And then in a follow-up work, we were able to improve the computational depth uh, to match the query depth and close this sort of depth gap. Um, there's one slight caveat, which is that the computational complexity increases by a little bit. Uh, but if you're willing to believe in uh, quadratic time matrix multiplication, it really does get the uh, optimal among all algorithms. Um, more generally, uh, if you plug in omega, omega equals 3, maybe using Gaussian elimination, it's slightly suboptimal in work. But in terms of all parallel measures of depth, um, 
it's state of the art. Yeah. 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 Uh, so sorry, mini matching like falls within this paradigm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So you, what you can do is you're allowed to query multiple things in parallel to reduce your variance. But you 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 want to make sure you do this in a way that doesn't incre increase your overall query complexity. So you you're like you're allowed to use any mini matching strategies you want. Yeah. So so in like in these definitions, like query depth is analogous to batch size. Or? Ah, so query depth is just the total number of rounds I submit. So it's more like um yeah, and right. over batch size, right? It's like the number of times I need to adaptively choose new points to query. So in this picture, Q depth is basically the number of times I perform this game. And then C depth is the total amount of depth used by my side computation. So I, the side computation itself might not be parallel, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, right. So that's why I have these poly one over epsilon factors. Uh, what you can do is you can produce highly accurate subgradient queries by just averaging a bunch of them. Um, so this, this will incur large polynomial factors in one over epsilon. And this is sort of like, it's not exactly clear what the best stochastic cutting thing method to do. But we're mostly focused on this regime where like SGD is provably suboptimal, but uh, we also don't want to use D rounds of interaction with the with the Oracle. Maybe we want to use a, a much smaller polynomial in D. Yeah. Cool. So I know this is like a lot of numbers. So if there's any more questions to digest this, uh, this page, we can tackle them before I move on. Um, OK, cool. Let me tell you a little bit about how we came up with these algorithms. So there's two main ingredients from prior work that we're building upon um, in developing our algorithmic framework. So the first is the following simple idea. Um, if you have a Lipschitz convex function f, then you can define this object called the Gaussian convolution of f, where you simply convolve f with a Gaussian density. Right? It's the average of um, f of x minus psi where psi is drawn from multivariate Gaussian of variance rho squared in every direction, OK? And why do we like this Gaussian convolution? This is a very friendly object. So it turns out that even if f itself is not differentiable, um, f rho, this Gaussian convolution, is not only differentiable, it's infinitely differentiable. And also, it's quantitatively infinitely differentiable. So I, I can produce bounds on, for example, its first derivative, its second derivative, and so on, purely based on the Lipschitz constant of f, OK? So that's, that's all very nice. Um, but the one problem about this is that it's only implicitly accessible, right? Like if I want to know the value of f rho x, I mean, I don't know how to do that, right? I can only produce uh, unbiased estimators for it, right? Uh, but no problem. The nice thing about this is that we're, we're in the parallel model of computation. And what we can do is we can submit many batches, uh, many queries in parallel and try to reduce the variance of our uh, implicit access to f, right? So this is sort of like the philosophy behind all these like previous um, parallel algorithms for SEO. OK. OK, so just to give you a sense of how previous algorithms use this Gaussian convolution object in designing faster algorithms, um, the DBW paper essentially noted that the smoothness of F rho gives us a slightly improved uh, uh, tool toolbox for you know, uh, op uh, optimization algorithm design. In particular, because it's smooth, I can run things like accelerated gradient descent. Right, so they basically formulated this problem as some kind of noisy access to a smooth function, and they applied noisy AGD um, with mini batches to improve the uh, the parallel complexity. Okay, so this is the first first result that improves in this intermediate regime. Yeah. So initially, in your setup, you didn't assume f is right. Right, right. F, f is possibly non-smooth. All I want to assume is that it has I have a bounded variance operator to it. Yeah. So I've also seen some works where, like, basically they add some random Gaussian noise to x. Like, you consider f of x plus theta, and like, to introduce basically smoothness. But... Yeah. So this, this is saying, like, even in this fully non-smooth setting, I can simulate this this idea by using this Gaussian convolution, which I don't have explicit access to. Yeah. So my my question was like, that is potentially simpler. Like, you don't need like much. So you're saying you're suggesting changing the problem definition. Or, um, I mean, instead of like Gaussian convolution, it seems a little bit more complicated because you have to do the same thing. Uh, like, I think it was like some paper. Okay, I'll tell you some algorithms which make it just just fine to use the Gaussian convolution. Um, but I guess more more generally, I wanted to make the minimal assumptions in my problem, right? I don't want to assume anything about how f is defined. I just want to assume a bounded variance stochastic estimator to it. Yep. I'll explain what we do with F row shortly, but maybe for now, let me just introduce this object. Cool. 
Okay, so in a follow-up work by um, these authors, they showed that actually I can use uh, the Gaussian convolution structure in a slightly different way. So what I can do is I can try to create a model of the gradient field over my entire space. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm just going to query uh, g of x minus psi at a bunch of different points and appeal to uniform concentration results to argue that doing this a few times is enough to simulate my entire space. And therefore, I don't need to query this again. Um, as a result, they incur a significant overhead in D is sort of the trade-off because you need to get these uniform convergence results, right? Okay. So what do we do? We basically prove some new structural aspects of this uh, Gaussian convolution and use them to our advantage to design faster algorithms. Um, I'll purposely not explain too much uh, where this is going. But the one thing I want to mention is that both of these bullet points have the word stability in them, right? And how are we going to use stability? Um, roughly speaking, it's just the following simple observation. It says that if you have the density of x minus psi, which, is, which, I, which I care about to evaluate the Gaussian uh, at, at x, right? And I want to compare it to some nearby point, x prime. Then as long as x and x prime are both not too large, right? These PDFs are locally multiplicatively stable. OK, this is sort of like a. Um, not, not not saying anything too deep, but it seems like we've sort of reduced the problem to the following um, sort of meta problem, which is we can use this stability to design very clever stochastic estimators locally. So localized to small, small balls, I'm able to use this stability structure to improve my, estima my estimation game, right? On the other hand, it's not clear how to aggregate these local um, sub-problem solvers in a way that says something meaningful globally, right? Okay. Sorry, I kind of disappointed yep. you. Ah, I mean, my point is that uh, it, this this gamma density has this local locally stable behavior. So if I'm forcing my points to stay local, I can use this stability to design faster, like smarter estimators, right? But more generally, if my points have started to drift far away, then I can't take advantage of this stability, right? Like just to give a high level idea, if I'm querying a bunch of points near this region and I want to estimate, you know, the subgradient out there. Right, I can't do that if my points have drifted too far away. So I need to like take care of this local behavior and then aggregate this in some way to solve the global problem. This is sort of like a high level picture of uh, how to take advantage of this fact. Make sense? Okay. So um, I want to take a step back and introduce a, the second main tool uh, in our in our algorithm design, which is a thing called ball acceleration. Um, so if folks here are taking my class, they might be familiar with this particular definition. Um, so Consider the following uh, optimization oracle. I won't tell you how to implement it quite yet, but all it does is it takes a center point x and it, output, it outputs the minimizer of this function f, not globally, but just in a small ball around x, right? So you can think of this as a sort of like a, an oracle that you could implement if you have really good local structure, but maybe not really good global structure, right? Um, so here's a picture, like you have some point x that might be far away from x star, and it's not going to tell you what x star is. It's just going to tell you the best point in a small ball around x, right? And a natural question, which is very related, uh, at least conceptually, to the previous slide, is how many times do I need to call this ball oracle before I can globally optimize my function, or at least in a ball of much larger radius than perhaps little r, right? And it's natural to conjecture. So uh, this is actually a homework problem in my uh, in my class, to show that um, calling the ball oracle one time roughly improves your suboptimality gap by a factor of one minus little r. Okay, so roughly speaking, this is just by using the fact that I can move r of the way along the distance from x to x star and then apply convexity, right? So it's naturally conjecture that you actually really need roughly one over r uh, little r queries to optimize um, the function over a unit ball. Right, because I need at least that many balls to even cover the line from my point to x star. Right. So in a surprising, at least surprising to me, result in 2020, we showed that actually the correct answer is roughly r to the minus 2 thirds. OK, and here we're somehow showing like the power of convexity is saying something much stronger than, um, than what, what this like naive line search story would, would, would let you uh, believe. So, this gives both a matching upper bound and a lower bound. Okay. Let me not say too much about how exactly we came up with this acceleration scheme, because this is really uh, in the weeds of optimization theory. But at a high level, the story is like this. Um, it's been known since the 90s that there's this thing called a accelerated proximal point method, 
which repeatedly calls this proximal oracle, which solves a trust region problem around X. So you should think of this as like sort of a softball oracle, right? It's not saying I exactly solve min f of X um, in a ball around X. It's saying I penalize how far away you move from X, right? And they have some aggregation scheme, but at the end of the day, what it's saying is that your function error, noted epsilon k, roughly decreases proportional to how fast this ak parameter grows. Okay. Don't worry too much about what these things actually are. Just know that previously, the move was to just choose your lambda parameters in a smart way and try to grow a using the fact that you're you, I, I have full control over my lambdas. Okay, this is sort of like the conventional belief from the 90s. Wait, what is what is it? A is some parameter given to you by the algorithm, but it roughly grows at the rate lambda k squared if all the lambdas are the same. Um, you have convexity and like... You have convexity and I don't assume anything about f in, in this particular scheme. But for, the, but for, your for my problem, I have I have logistics. That's right. Yeah. yeah. OK, so that's sort of the traditional way of analyzing this. And just to give you a flavor of how we analyzed it to improve this to r to the minus 2 thirds, what we show is that, so the first observation is that this ball oracle is basically like a proximal step with an unknown step size. I don't know what lambda is up front. And the way to see this is that as long as the overall global minimizer does not lie inside my ball, I can lift the, um, the constraint into a Lagrange multiplier, and that will introduce, for some multiple of the Lagrange multiplier, a uh, proximal step. That's sort of the high-level picture going on here. And the upshot is that I don't have any control of these lambda parameters anymore. So how fast does A grow? I have no idea, right? But the nice, the one nice thing is that there's this hidden term in the analysis that people typically just threw away. And in our case, I know that this always moves by exactly R, right? That's the definition of a ball oracle. And by recursing on this and using some sort of like integral inequalities, we can show that AK grows at the rate R to the minus two thirds. So do you have, do you have like a picture? That you can... Yeah. So unfortunately, this part of the this part of the thing is very technical, and this I don't I don't think it's worth spending too much time on. I just want to give you a high level idea of how we even prove this. Um, the 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 fun stuff will come later. Yeah. This is just to introduce you to this tool. Okay. How did you lambda? Oh, the point is we don't get to choose lambda. All we get to do is optimize these balls, but that process will give us these lambdas, and we show that no matter what lambdas are, we always improve by r to the minus two thirds. Let me, let me not dwell too much on this particular slide. Um, but in the first work where we introduced this, uh, this acceleration scheme, the way we implemented it was we just showed that a bunch of these functions, like logistic regression, softmax regression, and so on, have this sort of local Hessian stability behavior. Within small balls, the Hessian is multiply stable. So how do I implement this ball oracle quickly? I want to take advantage of this local stability structure, right? So what I do is I just query the, the Hessian at the center of the ball and implement Newton's method within the ball. This will give me a fast algorithm for solving these balls, and then I can aggregate it using our acceleration scheme. This is sort of like a first pass at using this, uh, this framework, right? And in a follow-up work, they showed that actually you don't need to solve these balls very exactly at all, right? If your overall target is epsilon, here's all you need to do. It, roughly speaking, for k is 1 over r to the 2 thirds, you just need to solve each of these subproblems to accuracy epsilon over k. So this is sort of a pleasing interpretation. It's saying if you want overall accuracy epsilon, then you just need to solve case ball subproblems each to epsilon over k error, right? And this is uh, roughly speaking the inexact um, uh, algorithm that is known in the literature. Okay, so that was a lot of uh, that was a lot of stuff. But roughly speaking, all we're saying now is we have these two tools. We have the Gaussian convolution, which is locally stable, and we have this ball aggregation acceleration scheme for aggregating locally stable solutions into a globally um, optimal solution. Is it stable? Like, is it like I'll make precise the notion of stability I mean later, but roughly speaking, all you should think is that the Hessian does not change multiplicatively within a small ball. It's like Hessian smoothness. Um, it's multiplicative Hessian smoothness. It's saying that the Hessian multiplicative does not change by too much. You should think like anytime I write an exponential, you should you should smell stability uh, in the air because you know x of x plus one is very close to x with x. So, so uh, just to the final like improvement you get is the dependence on these guys. Yeah, so I'll, I'll explain how to plug this stuff into the parallel framework shortly. But for now, just think these we have these access to these two tools, right? We have this locally stable thing, and we have this aggregation scheme. Okay. Yeah. Aggregation is for evaluating the Gaussian convolution. Ah, so again, I'll explain how these things fit into our, our framework shortly. Just for now, all I've just described is the two tools. Okay. 
So the nice thing is that uh, this aggregation scheme really just lets us focus on this much simpler problem, right? We have this locally stable uh, function f, and we want to optimize it uh, in small radii, right? And I can just focus on doing this k times. But the, 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 the key question is, how do I do this efficiently in parallel, right? OK. So now let me tell you about uh, the first estimator we proposed for solving this problem. Um, so here's the idea. Uh, we've reduced the overall problem of parallel convex optimization to the following problem. I just want to optimize in a small ball a Gaussian convolution with a regularization term, right? How accurately do I need it? Epsilon over k. k is the number of balls I call. Okay. Um, and the first observation is how small do I need to choose rho before a, a solution to this uh, Gaussian convolved problem says something meaningful about my original problem, right? Um, the key observation is how far does f rho differ from f? Um, roughly speaking, it differs by rho times the expected distance uh, that this convol Gaussian convolution will move me, right? Because this is the this is the lift distance chain, right? You get to choose rho. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll choose rho. I mean, in particular, we'll choose rho to be epsilon over root d, so it does not meaningfully affect the problem. Okay. And the second observation is it's actually very easy to compute a unbiased estimator for um, grad F row, right? I just sample a random Gaussian and I output this point. No problem, right? The problem is I haven't really shown you how to break adaptivity, right? Like it seems like anytime anything I could have done before, I haven't shown you any way of doing something different, right? Like I'm just saying you can query a, uh, a the Gaussian at a slightly different point, right? But I haven't told you how to do this adaptively, right? Okay. Um, but here's where local stability comes into the picture, right? Like why am I querying the point at x plus psi? Right. Really, it feels like I have the center point, and I know the Gaussian convolution is stable in this ball. I should just be querying at the center point, right? And crossing my fingers and hoping that these things are close, right? So here is where uh, the rescue estimator uh, comes into the story. So the, the basic idea is we're just going to query the point uh, stochastically at some point nearby the uh, nearby the, the center of the ball, right? And we're just going to reweight it. By some important sampling score that we we can compute later, and the key upshot of this is that I can query all of my stochastic gradients within a single ball, all in parallel, right? Because I know exactly what I'm going to do. I'm just going to sample a bunch of sides, oblivious to my points, and reweight these uh, these queries g of x bar plus psi, right? So at the start of a ball, I'm just going to submit all of these queries in parallel, and then take advantage of them in my algorithm as I go. How do I take advantage of them? I need to do this adaptively because the reweighting scheme now depends on my point x. So I sort of shifted the burden of uh, adaptivity from the oracle to my algorithm, right? OK. And um, I just want to quickly mention that these, uh, these rescue estimators are nice in many ways that aren't listed here. Um, in particular, we showed uh, various high order relative smoothness properties of these and used them to get um, uh, a state-of-the-art algorithm for private stochastic complex optimization in the same work. Oh, sorry, so you're saying the reweighting is just for adaptivity? So I'm saying that I've shifted the uh, the adaptivity from the oracle to my algorithm, right? Like I can query these g of x bar plus psi all at once, but I have to reweight them as I go on, right? So the reweighting is non-parallel, right? Is this why the computational cost is high? Yeah, exactly, exactly. So, uh, um, actually, we show that they don't they don't go by more than a constant factor, roughly speaking. Yeah, on average over the algorithm. So, yes, yeah, Simonakis has a great point. Like, it seems like because of this shifting of the burden, our algorithm is not still not fully parallel, and this is sort of the key challenge we tackled in the second work. Okay, great. So, just to like sketch out how the parameters work out for you, um, the overall query complexity. What is it, right? It's the cost of solving k subproblems, and how accurately do I need to solve them to accuracy lambda r squared? This is just the parameter that the outer loop gives us. And I have lambda strong convexity, right? So if you work out the, the trade-off, you get 1 over epsilon squared, which exactly matches SGD. So all I'm saying is that the total number of queries I ever submit is equal to SGD, right? And what's the query depth? Well, I only need to interact with the, uh, the oracle at the start of every ball, right? Because I can submit all of those questions in, in batch. So the overall depth is d to the 1 third epsilon to the minus 2 thirds. Um, it's 1 over little r to the 2 thirds. And recall, we set r to make sure that the Gaussian convolution does not drift by too much. OK, so hopefully 
Uh, the rescue story is fairly simple, but it seems like we've really dodged this challenge of like making our algorithm fully parallel. Right. So that's where the second paper comes in. Oh yeah. So so the computational depth right is not quite what the query depth is, and this is slightly improvable using various like mini batch and acceleration strategies, but it doesn't fully get around this issue. Does this so? I just have a question. Like... Yeah. Does this have anything to do with this like randomized midpoint method, like for sampling? Ah, so it's not fully related. So like, I, I guess in, in that setting, you're really trying to compute integrals, right? And here, like, I don't care about like actually computing anything. I just care about unbiased estimators, right? So like, they're 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 pretty different, I would say. Other than like the observation that you can write integrals as expectations, this is sort of the, the only thing they have in common. Well, I think I'm talking about like the method for sampling. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I, I know. Okay. It, yeah. It's you get, it's, like a, you get like a D to the one third there, I thought. Yeah, so it's it's coming up for a very different reason, I would say. Okay, but hopefully the, the story is clear so far. All we've done is we've shifted the adaptivity from the Oracle to our algorithm, right? So we started this for a little bit after we uh, we finished this paper, and we thought, thought about various strategies that you can make the algorithm itself uh, smarter. But our eventual solution um, kind of revisited the original framework for ball oracle design. If you recall, like the very first time we came up with this ball oracle acceleration framework, what we did was we just ran Newton's method, right? We just said the Hessian is stable in local regions. Let me just compute the Hessian once and then run Newton's method instead of the ball. The main trouble with this approach seems to be the fact that um, it's not clear that the Hessian of the Gaussian convolution is actually stable, right? Like in particular, what is the Hessian of the Gaussian convolution? It's just the average of the Hessians at random points, right? And while my points are close to the origin, right? While x bar and x are close, this is totally fine, right? These things are multiply stable. But the instance I don't have these uh, these points are locally stable, it seems like I have to compare Hessians at totally different points, and I don't even assume you know smoothness or like any kind of differentiability at all. Right, it's unclear how to bound the Hessians at these faraway points. Right, so what do I do? And uh, after you know three or four years of staring at this problem, we realized that actually we can use a simple trick. You can just use the fact that the Gaussian convolution is the convolution of the halfway convolution with another Gaussian. Right, if you just convolve with a Gaussian to raise over two twice, you get back the original Gaussian. Right, and now there's this nice fact that. You know, the Gaussian convolution itself is smooth. So now I can compare these faraway points as long as the probability that things are far away is not too large, right? So formally, what we're able to show is that um, if x and x bar are like a little bit closer than this Gaussian convolution radius rho, then you do have this multiplicative, st multiplicative stability up to a small additive term, which we can tolerate. Sort of like the first insight that uh, motivated the second work. Um, OK. So I've shown that we can implement Newton's method, but I don't give you Hessian access, right? I don't even give you like gradient access. I only give you stochastic gradient access, right? So how do you run Newton's method if you can't compute a Hessian, right? So here's the um, the second part of the story, which is, okay, um, the Gaussian convolution has a Hessian, which is just the average Hessian of randomly sampled points, right? But by using some Gaussian integration by parts trickery, you can actually show another formula for the Hessian of a Gaussian, uh, Gaussian convolution. It's just the average of a bunch of rank one matrices. And these rank one matrices only depend on the gradient. And this is the kind of Oracle axis I do have, right? Um, the downside of this is, okay, so now, now maybe a picture is starting to form in your head where we want to run Newton's method in each ball. And all we have is this G axis, right? So why don't I just form a very good approximation to the Hessian of, uh, at the center point using my first order axis appeal to concentration and then run Newton's method, right? That sounds like a great plan. The problem with this plan is that actually you need many samples before um, these uh, rank one terms will actually concentrate to the Hessian. I mean, intuitively you need at least D of them, right? Because like you, you need, if you want your uniform concentration to the to a high dimension, uh, high rank objects and I only give you rank one estimates, I'm gonna need D of them, right? And recall like the whole point of doing all of this work was we were trying to not run a cutting plane method. We were trying to not use D rounds of adaptivity to the Oracle, right? Okay, so what do we do? Um, we showed that actually optimizing in this stochastic Hessian is easier than approximating it. So even without knowing what the Hessian is, we can still optimize quadratics in it. So Newton's method really cares about 
optimizing quadratics in this Hessian, right? It doesn't say anything that you have to know what the Hessian is up front, right? So what you can do is you can use your rank one estimates and show that if you look at, if you design your rank one estimates in a clever way, you can use the fact that, you know, the expected operator norm of a Gaussian is bounded by one. And this will let you save this d-factor savings. So at a high level, we dodge this question of approximating the Hessian by just optimizing in it without approximating. OK, so that's that's the second ingredient. And then there's one more trick, which I need to mention, which is that another obstacle to adaptivity, like recall, we want to do all of this in parallel, right? Another obstacle to doing that is the fact that I have this hard ball constraint, right? Like if my points start to drift outside the ball, I need to like know that and then like correct my algorithm to take advantage of that, right? Like uh, in, in world one, where the things stay inside the ball, I don't need to worry about the boundary constraint. And in world two, where the points start leaving the ball, now I need to start worry about, worrying about the boundary constraint. And it seems to be a barrier for adaptivity, right? Um, but no worries. We show that actually you can just do a binary search on a Lagrange multiplier and turn this into an unconstrained problem. OK, the one challenge with this is that to do this binary search successfully, you need to make sure that you solve these unconstrained problems um, to high accuracy, uh, with high probability. They can't just be like constant accuracy failure. Type of things. You want to make sure your binary search really narrows down on the right Lagrange multiplier, right? And um, I actually teach how to do this uh, boosting from a high pro from a constant probability oracle to a high probability stochastic optimization oracle in my class. This, this is one of the homework problems. So if you're curious how to do this, um, maybe have a try for yourself. But it turns out this is no problem even uh, without things like uh, uh, probability one bounds on tails. Okay, and finally, uh, it seems like I'm dodging this question of uh, actually implementing Newton's method by running SGD, right, using these rank one estimates. But I haven't shown you how to actually compute that stuff in parallel. And it turns out all of this can be abstracted into the following linear algebra maintenance problem, where you have a sequence of points, uh, x0, updated recursively by this following thing. And this following thing is given to you entirely upfront. So basically, at x0, you have a sequence of vectors U T V T W T. I give you all. I give all all of these things to you up front at the beginning of the algorithm, and I want you to compute the iterates in parallel, right? So where these things are coming from is I need to deal with the regularization term due to the Lagrange multiplier. That's C T. I need to deal with the rank one update coming from my stochastic estimation. That's U T and V T, and I need to deal with the fact that I also have to like take gradient steps. That's W T. But in principle, what you should think is at the beginning of the ball. I've computed all of these UTVTs, WTs, and CTs all up front. And now I just need you to run your algorithm in parallel, right? And to do this, um, we show you can do this in polylog depth and work that is almost linear. So in a sense that, what's the dream, right? If I give you these T things, the sequential algorithm just does them each one at a time and pays DT work, right? We show that at a small overhead, um, depending on the matrix multiplication exponent, you can still implement this fairly quickly, OK? And how do we do this? Maybe I'll uh, table this for now. But it's at a high level, just a, um, a combination of low rank maintenance tricks and divide and conquer. Um, OK, cool. And yeah, uh, thanks for coming to my talk and happy to take any questions. Question for Devin. Yep. See, if you have like. Ah, good. Then, then you can just directly run AGD on that. So, yeah, yeah. Like add noise to AGD data and then like utilize this. Again. Yeah, this is sort of like a like we're, our method is sort of making this formal. It's it's saying like how small exactly do I need the Gaussian to be tightly centered? And then how do I submit these queries and use them uh, in my algorithm uh, in parallel? So it's kind of like make, making that uh, intuition precise. Yeah, exactly. If the data had any like existing noise that maybe like could be modeled by a filter, like it would still be okay. Ah, so that's 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 more about like the the modeling assumption on how exactly your stochastic optimization problem is set up. Like maybe you have some you know points which are likely to lie far away. I'm hiding all of that in the definition of the problem. Okay, thanks, Kevin.